That's that sort of our mission statement, and that's where we have uh, 1.4 million subscribers today. Today, 90% of America lacks access to broadband. That's 85 million Americans don't have access, if they wanted it, to broadband. Projections indicate that even as far out as 2005, there will be some 40 million homes, uh, mostly in rural areas, that still will not have access to broadband. Rural Americans are in danger of being left out of the digital re revolution, and are in danger is 11. <clears throat> From um, a full coma slot, the satellite footprint is ubiquitous, and it's capable of covering uh, and providing digital services such as broad, broadband. Pegasus believes that it's the most cost efficient and effective solution for bridging, for bridging the technology gap between urban and rural America. In fact, we've re recently launched our two-way broadband product in April. The implications of being able to access broadband for rural and underserved areas are very significant. Just one figure that I read that really impressed me emphasizes that today only 29% of farms, U.S. farms, have access to the Internet. Um, and so you may say, well, why do farmers care? <laughs> why do they need access to broadband? But studies have estimated that if all American farms today in 2001 had access access to high-speed internet, um, there would be a, a savings of some five billion dollars. <throat> Through improved production, lower cost inputs, precision agriculture, televeterinary medicine, um, and other management aids, and that's just farming, that, that, doesn't, mean, that doesn't even take into account other uh, economic applications with respect to medicine and education. Satellite companies, we believe, are uniquely positioned to bridge the technology gap because of the ubiquitous footprint uh, from 22,000 miles above the equator. They can see uh, everything from New York City all the way over to California uh, to rural Montana, and it's a ubiquitous footprint. The vision is becoming a reality, but for continued growth, we must plan for growing capacity needs of tomorrow, today. I'll be happy to answer any questions um, that you might have. Great. I, I'm going to ask a couple of questions, but first I'm delighted that uh, one of the co-chairs of the Congressional Internet Caucus, uh, Congressman Goodlatte, is here. I'd like to invite him up to, uh, yeah. do you want to say anything? No, keep going. Are you sure? They every time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Well, let me just ask, let, let's ask the follow-up question on how much capacity you can, satellites can handle. Um, it is a capacity issue today. Um, we believe we've looked at the numbers and at the take-up rate that we expect. Um, there's enough capacity we anticipate for upwards of 700,000 to a, a million additional consumers. Um, and we believe that'll take about three years. It takes a lot of lead time to build and launch additional capacity to launch a satellite, and it's about three years. So again, it's a capacity issue that we need to be looking at today with respect to our spectrum management policies uh, to, uh, so that we have enough capacity to expand markets for tomorrow. Okay. Um. I should have mentioned this at first. What we're going to do is have all the panelists go through their presentations, um, and then we'll, we'll open it up to the floor for questions. So I don't want to suppress the questions, but I do want to let all the panelists have a chance to, to make their presentations first. Um, our second presenter is Robert Coppell, uh, who's Vice President, uh, Wireless Regulatory Affairs of WorldCom, uh, advising WorldCom on all the regulatory and business issues regarding fixed and mobile wireless services. Uh, before assuming his current position, he was also WorldCom's Vice President of International Regulatory Affairs, as well as the Vice President of Legal and Regulatory Affairs for IDB Communications, which was acquired by WorldCom in 1994. And previous to that, he practiced telecommunications law uh, for seven years with Aaron Fox uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, welcome, welcome, Bob. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to try to focus on sort of the black box technology of fixed wireless. 
And I want to just address three questions. What is it? How does it work? And what is it useful for? What is it is pretty easy. It's the use of radio spectrum to deliver high-speed internet access to fixed customer locations, as opposed to mobile services that you're all aware of. Um, there's a couple of different applications. I think we're on the wrong slide, but that's OK. There's only three slides. Um, there's, there's different spectrum that can be used to deliver this broadband technology. AT&T, for example, is using their PCS spectrum in a few markets for fixed services. But what I'd like to focus on is what we call MMDS, multi-channel, multi-point distribution service. The major operators <coughs> of MMDS service are WorldCom, Sprint, and a smaller company based in Texas called NewCentrix. The MMDS operators use frequency at the 2.1 gigahertz band, which is 2100 megahertz, and at the 2.5 to 2.7 gigahertz band, 2500 to 2690 megahertz, to deliver their service. And what makes MMDS so valuable is that it is a facilities-based, last-mile competitive alternative to DSL and cable broadband. And like the satellite service providers, um, we believe that we have a product that can serve many, many people who are currently unserved in rural areas and in urban and particularly suburban areas um, where you have residential and business developments along highways that are well outside the 12,000 to 18,000 foot copper foot um, radius that DSL can serve from each central office and areas that are not served by cable broadband or maybe served by cable broadband but cable broadband is the only provider and therefore there's no competition in the provision of broadband services. How does it work? If we could go to the first slide, Net. How does it work? Simple. We mount a central base station, one base station in most markets, on either a tall tower, on the roof of a tall building, or on a mountaintop. And that hub station transmits to and receives from a small transmit receive antenna that is mounted on the customer's roof. This is the customer premise transmit receive antenna. Um, we're working on technologies to make this even smaller, but this is the size of the antenna that we're currently using. From the customer's rooftop antenna, this is then hardwired into the customer into a modem that sits next to the customer's PC. The signal from a central base station tower carries up to 35 miles. What is MMDS good for? Well, because of the coverage, the 35 mile radius from a single transmitting tower, it's particularly well suited for coverage of suburban and rural areas. And it's also very well suited for covering small and mid-sized markets. The target customer base is residential customers and small and medium businesses. Because of this wide geographic reach, and the favorable propagation characteristics of the signal. In the band that we operate in, the radio signal is not subject or not typically subject to, to weather effects. If you go up into higher bands, if it rains heavily, the signal will be degraded. In the 2.5 gigahertz bands, there is little, if any, effect from bad weather. Because we can reach such a wide area, and because we can do it, with a modest capital investment. That's what makes it commercially feasible to serve folks who are outside the areas that the cable broadband and the DSL people are already serving. And it's not that hard to deploy. You need, all you need is a building and a customer who wants the service. You don't have to dig any trenches. You don't have to upgrade the cable plant for the entire community. You don't have to upgrade the central office. Um, you could put in, if you wanted to, and in, in a few cases where we've done demonstrations, we can put in a broadband fixed wireless MMDS system in less than a week 
in a city. Now, to do it right, obviously, it takes a little longer than that, but it can be implemented very quickly, and it can be implemented incrementally, which gives us a very good financial control over it. As you gain more customers, you can add more channels to your system, and after you get beyond the point where you can't serve everyone from a single transmitting site, you can then go to a cellular architecture and use multiple transmitting sites in a city. The data speeds that we offer are 256 kilobits per second up to 1.5 megabits per second. And we have the ability to guarantee service levels to customers that pay a premium. The service charges to date have been comparable to DSL and cable, although I suppose we'll have to increase our charges now. Um, the residential service has been offered for 40 to $50 per month. And that's, that's it. I'm going to keep within my five minutes. Great. Thank you. Let me just ask one quick question. Since there's been a lot of discussion about 3G, um, is 3G a substitute for the kind of fixed wireless broadband that you are providing? Um, I, don't, I don't see 3G as a substitute at all for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, MMDS is here and now. It's being deployed today. Uh, 3G, as many people know, is still seeking spectrum and still seeking certain um, standard standardization of their systems. Um, furthermore, when, when 3G does get deployed, um, it almost certainly will be deployed initially in the major metropolitan areas, in the biggest cities, New York and Los Angeles. The cities that, that WorldCom is targeting are the what, the smaller cities, cities like Dothan, Alabama, and Chattanooga, Tennessee, markets that we don't think would see 3G for a long time. Um, in addition, MMDS will provide consistently higher data rates, much higher data rates. Although 3G talks about providing service up to 1.5 or 2 megabits per second, clearly they're going to be focused on the mobile market and they will be offering lower speeds in the range of 100, 200, maybe 300 kilobits per second, maybe. And, and also, um, because of the folks who are deploying 3G, most of them are related to the cable broadband providers, AT&T Wireless, or the incumbent local exchange carriers, Verizon and Singular, um, we think that it's unlikely that they're going to cannibalize their own market, that they're, they're their affiliates are providing DSL and cable broadband, and we think it's unlikely that the mobile service affiliates are going to cannibalize um, their affiliates' own market for broadband services. Great. Congressman, did you? I just want to ask, a company in my uh, hometown, Roanoke, Virginia, is rolling out a new high-speed broadband <coughs> internet service using optical laser technology. I wonder if you're familiar with that and know anything about the, the uh, possibilities for that, where they're actually shooting laser beams around the valley, um, transmitting high-speed data. Um, I, I've read a little bit about it, but I don't. I really don't know enough to comment on it. Anybody else? I know. I'm in <laughs> okay. Uh, stump the panel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's usual. Well, I know that. <laughs> well, none of us are going to become millionaires. Um, <laughs> Now we're going to move over to the cable platform. Uh, we have with us Dr. William Cheek, who is Vice President of Science and Technology of the National Cable and Telecommunications Association. Uh, Dr. Cheek has been in the field of telecommunications for over 20 years prior to his time at NCTA. He was involved in a number of different organizations, including the satellite and broadcast industries, and has led the development of packet data, video, and audio communication systems. Dr. Cheek. Uh, thanks, Blair, and thanks very much to the uh, Congressional Internet Caucus for the opportunity uh, to be here this afternoon. Um, a couple of comments on the cable plan itself first. Uh, of course, the original idea for cable was for rural television distribution. And in that case, back in the 50s, uh, in the case where you had mountains or areas where television stations were too far away from uh, customers' homes, someone would put up an uh, antenna, and from that antenna run coaxial cable around the community to serve uh, the subscribers. From that, uh, the cable television industry grew, and in the 1970s and in the early 1980s, uh, programming began to be distributed over satellites. 
So satellite delivered television programs are now added into the mix of the cable system. And today, when you look at a cable head end, which is really the central point in uh, a, a cable television system in a particular community, the cable head end uh, deals with a variety of different technologies. It uh, delivers the local broadcaster signals, so there's equipment for that. There's equipment relating to the satellite channels. And now, in the past couple of years, uh, there's equipment for high-speed data and voice and telephony applications. Um, if you look at this, this uh, diagram, the upgrading the existing cable for broadband, the original cable plant, when you go back and you look at the 1950s and how it evolved, was uh, dealing with what was called a tree and branch approach. The coaxial cable fed out from the central site, and, and much like a tree, it just branched out to different people's homes. What's happened now, though, is there's an uh, evolution in the architecture for cable, and it's something called HFC, which stands for Hybrid Fiber Coax. And the way this works now is that fiber optics and fiber strands are used to deliver the signal out into different neighborhoods. And then once you get into the neighborhoods, then the signal is converted into the coax cable, and there it travels to the individual subscribers' homes. And again, at the subscriber level, it's, it branches out like a tree. So as you see the diagram, what happens is when, when you reach a, what's called a node or this, this neighborhood point where the fiber ends, um, the amount of homes that that particular piece of fiber would support, on the diagram it shows 500 to 1,000 homes, but in some cases it can be two or 3,000 homes. It really depends upon the individual system. And at that point, when it's converted into a coax cable, then uh, along the way, uh, as the, the coax travels through the neighborhood, there's amplifiers to keep the signal at the proper levels. And th the thing that happens now to support data applications is it has to be a two-way cable plant. <coughs> so it it's, has the ability to transmit and receive signals. So you have two-way amplifiers along the line now. There's also something shown here called a tap, and that's really a point where the cable uh, leaves the main branch and goes into your neighborhood and into your home. Now the, uh, the data part of all this, how it sits on the cable plant, uh, are really two major items of interest here. One is in the home, you have a cable modem that you can connect to your computer. And at the cable head end location, uh, there's a piece of equipment that talks to all the cable modems uh, that it's serving. And that piece of equipment is called a CMTS, a Cable Modem Termination System. And that, that CMTS is very important in terms of uh, making sure that all the cable modems talk together properly. Yeah. Um, this page really explains a little bit how the connection works between this head end, this uh, CMTS box that uh, connects to all the cable modems out in the individual homes. The, the CTMS is sitting at the head end, and to send a signal to the homes, uh, the data as it comes in from an ISP or, or from the internet will be broadcast really across the coax to all the homes. And the cable, cable modem will know which piece of data is meant for itself and extract the piece of data for that particular cable modem. So in the downstream, it's kind of a broadcast application. In the upstream, uh, the distinguishing characteristic for, for the cable plant is that it's a shared environment, meaning that each cable modem uh, will try transmitting to send a message back to the head end when it needs to, when, when someone's sitting on their computer typing. Uh, but because it's shared, uh, if two modems are talking at the same time, uh, one of the transmissions may get interrupted by another. The transmissions will actually collide. The cable modems and the CTMS have the intelligence to try to work that out and make sure that the signals and the messages are sent from the cable modem back to the CTMS properly and without delay. Um, the shared environment is very similar to other technologies uh, in uh, satellite distribution systems and in the DBS example where uh, companies are now deploying two-way uh, data, high-speed data communications. Uh, in that case, the satellite itself is the shared medium. 
so there are sharing and other technologies. Okay, if I, just a quick question. Um, can you tell us about DOCSIS? What is DOCSIS and the DOCSIS modem? Um, DOCSIS is something that uh, you will hear a lot about in terms of cable modem technology. DOCSIS is really a specification. It's called the Data Over Cable Service Interface Specification. Uh, and it's really a standard for building equipment to transmit high-speed data over cable TV. And the distinguishing characteristic about it is it allows different vendors to build to this specification and that will allow different vendors' equipment to operate all on the same cable TV plant. Or if someone takes their DOCSIS compliant modem and then moves to a different city, then that DOCSIS modem would work in that other city as well. The DOCSIS process was started in uh, 1996 by Cable Labs, which is the R&D organization of the cable industry. And when a vendor goes through a design to complete their modem, uh, they have to go through a interoperability testing and certification effort at Cable Labs to make sure that it supports all the necessary functionality it needs to, as well as working properly with other uh, vendors' equipment. And at this point, over 130 uh, different DOCSIS modems have been certified by Cable Labs. So DOCSIS is very important uh, in the uh, high-speed cable modem industry. Great. Thank you very much. Um, next, we're going to talk about the, the um, telco platform, DSL, Digital Subscriber Lines. And with us is Lynn Collins, of, um, who is Assistant Vice President, Internet and Technology Issues for Verizon. Um, he began his career in 1977 in the United States Senate as a legislative aide. He worked for almost eight years on Capitol Hill, serving as a legislative aide and eventually deputy staff director on the Senate Governmental Affairs. Uh, committee in, in 1985. He left Capitol Hill to take a position which, uh, with uh, Bell Atlantic, the predecessor company to Verizon. And there he helped develop and manage the company's issues management and strategic uh, issues planning process. And also on a personal note, I might, might add that uh, at a time when I was not unlike yourselves being lobbied, um, he was one of the most effective and thoughtful lobbyists on, on the uh, issues of the relationship between the Internet and public policy. Link? Thank you, Blair. I just wanted to note for the record, by the way, that uh, the Internet Caucus is a group of companies that sometimes battle each other on policy, in it, but we do get together in these forums and operate on a nonpartisan basis. And just as evidence of that, these slides were prepared by AT&T, and I did not fight them, and they're great slides. I just wanted to tell you that. But I'm not switching to AT&T long distance. <laughs> um, DSL is a digital subscriber line technology. Essentially, it takes the spectrum or the space that's on the telephone line, your local loops that go to your home from the central office to your homes, and uses it more efficiently. Spectrum is anything, any kind of medium that can transmit electronic signals, including the air. That's what you're used to is the air. But on wires, there's also spectrum available. Traditionally, because we've designed the telephone network for voice, it didn't use all that space. So a lot of it is left over. In, fa in fact, thousands of kilohertz of space are left over that can be used. So what DSL does, as in this graph shows you, is we put electronics in the central office, which is where your local loop from your home is connected to, through these twisted pair or local loop copper wires. We also put a type of a switch called an ATM switch, which essentially is a packet switch used for the internet. And we put electronics in your home, on your computer. These two devices, the electronics at both ends then, essentially are able to make use of that spectrum that's not used today for voice service. It's a good technology. It provides speeds that are, it can be if, if you get close enough to the home. In fact, if you get within 1,000 or 2,000 feet of the home with your electronic device, the uh, d line that's in this picture here, you can actually provide speeds that uh, would give you video, several video channels on your copper loop. That's possible. But that's the limiting factor with DSL, that in fact the distance that you are from the D, from the D slam or the central office makes it uh, impossible to provide over a certain distance, about 18,000 feet. So when you get beyond that, generally DSL is not able to be provided. So, uh, it's a very efficient technology, and there is one limitation too with it, and that is, aside from distance, that there are other types of devices that we use for voice traditionally to make the voice network work well that can interfere with DSL. For example, sometimes loops are long, and we provide have put things called loading coils in there to strengthen the voice signal that interferes with DSL. So we have to take those off, and we're going to provide DSL over your copper loop. But generally, we don't have to do anything to, uh, essentially to the loop. We don't have to take it out of your home. It just stays there. We put electronics in to make the service possible. Next slide. 
quickly the cost issues here, and this is where the costs get pretty dramatic with DSL, is that we today traditionally have local loops that go from your house to the, to the uh, central office, and some of those are way over 18,000 feet. If you ride the service outside of that, we usually ch uh, put out a uh, remote terminal, it's called. So essentially what we do is put this box out closer to people's homes, take the loops and connect them to these remote terminals. That shortens the loop, and we take that remote terminal and connect it to the central office with a fiber optic ca cable. The problem with that technology today is that there's, there's a lot of remote terminals we have to put out there to, to make it possible to provide this service, and it's very expensive. So even though DSL on the one side, it may sound like it's a cheap technology to offer because you're not taking the loops out. All you're doing is, quote, putting electronics in. The electronics are expensive, and in Verizon's case, we have 51,000 remote terminals to be used. So to be able to offer the service to all of our population, we'd have to make changes to all those remote terminals at some stage. So it can be a very expensive and challenging uh, technology, just like all the other technologies are. It does cost a lot of money to do it. This final slide just quickly shows you when I was talking about the spectrum and how we use the spectrum. The bottom part of it, the real small line at the bottom is what voice uses. That gives you an, an idea of how little amount of the spectrum is used. Essentially 4 kilohertz is used today for voice. All the rest of that space, essentially 1.1 megahertz of space is left over to use. So that's what we use for DSL. And there's a two-way channel essentially. With ADSL, which is the asynchronous version of DSL, which is the common type of DSL we offer in the telephone network today, for most telephone companies do. It is essentially one way faster into your home and slower going out. Great. Uh, just a, a quick thing. Is DSL the broadband platform for the phone companies or is it a transitional technology as you move toward fiber optics, bringing fiber closer to the, uh, the home? With respect to broadband, I say almost every technology is transitional because they're all changing. But true, uh, tr there's no question that DSL is a bridging technology, a way to get uh, broadband to people's homes as quickly as we can. We ultimately, and that's why I was talking about the fiber that goes out to these remote terminals, want to get high speed or high capacity lines, including fiber out closer to people's homes. But it's a lot of investment to do that, and we need to make, establish a market, as I think someone earlier said, get that broadband out there and get people to buy the service. Well, thank you. Uh, we're going to move now from the platform side over to the application side. Uh, our, our first speaker in that regard um, uh, is from Ed, uh, Enron Broadband Services. It's Rocky Story, who's the Vice President of Origination and uh, came to us from Houston, Texas for this. So we really appreciate his traveling. He's worked for Enron for over 20 years, where he's worked uh, in, with engineering, power and asset development, contracts, regulatory, gas marketing and trading, and broadband services. Rocky? Thank you, Blair. Also, I'd like to say thank you to the advisory committee for allowing me to speak this afternoon. I probably have five hours of material that I've been told that I have to condense into five minutes, so I'll have to get rid of all the jokes, the preliminaries. That's probably the best part. But I'll get straight to the content. What I'd like to do is just share a few minutes and give you an overview of what Enron is doing in broadband. And I'll start with a couple bullet points. First of all, Enron is one of the leading Electricity, natural gas, and communication companies in the world. We're a leading marketing company um, for natural gas and electricity. We're number seven on the Fortune 500 with over $100 billion in revenue in year 2000. We've been named to America's most innovative company for at least six, six consecutive years by Fortune. And we operate the largest online trading platform in the world with over $3.5 billion worth of transactions on a daily basis. One of the new business units that Enron has developed is our Enron Broadband Services. The primary reason that we got into broadband is that we want to take the education, the experience, the knowledge that we have by being the largest marketer of natural gas and electricity and begin to apply that to the broadband market. Our whole intent is to create connectivity and liquidity and the bandwidth market. To do this, we've chosen to focus in three primary areas. It's intermediation services, an Enron intelligent network, and then content services. Within the intermediation services, simply our goal is to be the largest buyer and seller of bandwidth and network services. We want to stimulate the marketing and trading of bandwidth. As I mentioned earlier, we have the largest e-commerce platform where we we have transactions of over $3.5 billion a day of transactions for commodities such as natural gas, electricity, pulp and paper, metals, and to a certain extent, bandwidth. What we're wanting to do is take the experience that we have with these other commodities and apply that to the commodity of bandwidth. 
here's how our trades are going. In the first, in year 2000, we facilitated approximately 250 trades for bandwidth capacity. For the first quarter of this year alone, we've already executed almost 600 trades for bandwidth capacity with terms that range from one month all the way to 10 years. And we continue to see the activity grow on the bandwidth trading. The next area that, we want, that we're concentrating on is building an Enron intelligent network. We want to deploy the most open and efficient global network in the world. We want to utilize the 18,000 miles of Enron fiber that we own. We have third party contracted capacity that we're utilizing. We're developing pooling points in the industry and we're also creating network control. And the intent is to create a system that we can trade and, and increase the, the connectivity and the liquidity of bandwidth. We've currently created 25 pooling points. There's 18 in the United States that's represented on the map that you see. And we have seven pooling points that we created overseas. And the intent of the pooling point is to act as an aggregation point in a lot of the other industries that we see as natural gas and electricity is that the pooling points are, to, are intended to interconnect the networks of, of the fiber systems so that we can better facilitate the transmission of data from point A to point B or from the content provider all the way to the customer. A great example of what we foresee for bandwidth in the future is by looking at the gas industry and seeing how they utilize and they price off of their, their large pooling hubs such as the Henry Hub and the Chicago Hub. The next area that we're concentrating on is content services. Our goal is to be the largest provider of premium content services. We're currently in discussions with all the major studios. We're negotiating for the new releases and titles to add to our content. We're negotiating with gaming companies, with music companies, and other companies to provide content. We're working with the leading technology companies to provide the best technology, the latest and greatest to the consumers. And we're also working with the various distribution partners so that we can access the customer through the last mile. One of the things that we're really excited about with Enron is that on, in December of 2000, basically six months ago, we successfully implemented and, and launched our VOD program to over 600 customers in four cities in the United States. Those four cities were Manhattan, New York, Salt Lake City, Seattle, and Portland, Oregon. What we provided was a premium movie content that was a VHS quality or better with the ability for the customer to access the movie at their home anytime during the day with VCR capabilities. The other thing we did is that we partnered in each of the cities, we partnered with a distribution partner with either a DSL or a cable partner to provide the VOD service. For example, in Manhattan, we partnered with Verizon. Here we provided VOD over a DSL platform. The bandwidth for this offering was 1.8 megabits per second, and we proved that video on demand can be provided over DSL by either an ILEC or a CLEC architecture. The next example was in Salt Lake City. Here we partnered with SwitchPoint. Here we also provided VOD over a cable platform, and we successfully proved that, and this was at a bandwidth of 3.0 megabits per second. And again, we successfully proved that we can provide VOD over a cable platform, whether it be over an MSO or an overbuilder's architecture. In Portland and Seattle, very similar to Manhattan, we provided these over a DSL platform with a different distribution partner. Again, the offering is at 1.8 megabits per second. Because of the success that we've had in the VOD, we're now working on our next generation technology which will enable us to provide entertainment on demand. Our entertainment application will include movies, games, music, uh, live events, concerts, sports, uh, educational information programs. We will have PVR capability, which is the personal video recording capabilities. We will also provide e-commerce and the ability to provide interactive TV, which is the real-time two-way communication capabilities. Uh, it would give you the ability to be watching a concert live in your home and use remote control to order a CD with, of the music that you're listening to. Uh, we're also currently testing our next generation technology that will stream over either DSL or the cable platform at even lower bit rates than what we tested previously. I would say the technology over the last six months has 
progressed so rapidly that we're now testing our EOD platform and applications over less than one megabit per second and even as low as 750 kilobits per second. Now that's compared to the 1.8 megabits per second that we used in Manhattan and Portland and Seattle. Uh, this is the type of advancements that we're seeing and, we, and that we think we will continue to see in the technology arena. Other things that we're doing to improve and incorporate into our set-top boxes is to put capacity or storage into the set-top box that will allow us to store content at the set-top and even improve the, the, the quality of service that we can provide to the customers. A slide, I guess from an application perspective, we've proven that VOD can be a viable service over DSL and cable. And we think shortly we will be, be able to provide and, and prove that EOD can be provided a, a viable service over the same platform. In conclusion, I would say, and I want to emphasize that Enron is last mile agnostic. We're, we're willing to work with all of the, the last mile providers, and we currently provide services to a lot of the ISPs, the telcos, some of the overbuilders, uh, and some of the satellite companies. The bottom line, we believe it's very important that we either partner with the last mile provider or that we have access to the last mile platform so that we can provide the technology that is needed and help implement the technology that is needed to provide the quality of service that's needed to be able to, to and, and really the customer choice that's needed at the customer platform for all of our customers. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Michael Timoney, uh, who is the Washington representative for Cisco, uh, which I believe all of you know is the probably leading company for networking for the Internet. Um, Michael opened Cisco's Washington office in February of 1998. Prior to that, he was vice president for domestic policy at the American Electronics Association. And prior to that, he served in Capitol Hill for 21 years in numerous capacities. Michael? Thank you. Thank you, Blair, and thank you to the uh, Internet Advisory Council for um, inviting me here to talk about the Cisco Network Academy, which is what I want to talk about. Um, we've heard a lot of technical talk about broadband, and, um, and we at Cisco believe that broadband is the key to uh, improving, keeping a strong economy and having an efficient economy. We believe that, the, that the, what broadband is really about is uh, delivering um, opportunity, information, and efficiency. And what I want to talk about today is a program uh, that is one course um, that Cisco Systems offers um, called the Cisco Network Academy uh, program. And um, at Cisco, as it says up there, we believe that education and the Internet are the two equalizers in life. So this is, this is an application of, of why, you, this is why we need broadband. This is, this is a program that we have that is a, a worldwide program. And, and as you can see, we have 160,000 students enrolled in this program um, around the world in 7,000 academies in 128 countries with 12,000 instructors in which we give 14,000 tests a day um, all over the Internet. Uh, basically, I'll go into what the, what the uh, students are learning in a second, but this is an Internet-based curriculum. It is all taught over the Internet. It is all, um, there are assessment tools, which are the, are the tests. Every aspect of it um, uh, faces assessments. Uh, the student's performance, the teacher's performance, the viability of and the applicability of the curriculum, uh, it's constantly assessed. Uh, we also think, and we've discussed this with uh, leaders uh, here on Capitol Hill and also with the administration that this perhaps may be uh, one method of, of using, of utilizing testing that has been discussed in the re recent education bill that just passed. In the United States, this program exists in all 50 states in the District of Columbia. We have 3,900 academies, and we enroll nearly um, over 90,000 students, and we have 10,000 teachers uh, involved in this. And here's just sort of a breakdown of where it is. This is a program that is 40% um, of it goes to uh, students in high schools, 40% of it goes to students in junior colleges, and then other programs exist at, in, in, in other areas like in, in empowerment zones, in Native American communities, also in the U.S. Army and the U.S. Air Force. 
here's what they're learning. Very, uh, uh, very basic networking uh, studies and very tough. This is, these are tough courses. I've been to these, uh, the academies uh, from, uh, from coast to coast. There's one actually, there's several here in the District of Columbia. They're learning basically the fundamentals of building, designing, and maintaining networks. And uh, this, is, uh, this is not um, uh, something uh, that is easy. Uh, the kids basically say that the challenge for them is that this is so hard and that there's a lot of reading and that there's a lot of work that they have to do. But what happens is, uh, it, which is so interesting, is that after they finish this course, they then get certified and go out and uh, can get jobs with a variety of companies, many of the companies on this panel. Or if they go on to academic studies, invariably they go on to courses like um, electrical engineering or computer sciences, which is something as, as, as all of us have been involved in the H-1B debate, we've been concerned about where the American workforce um, is going and where we're going to get workers for an IT industry. So here, here are just the websites on it. And if you're interested in finding out for your own states, um, the one that's the most interesting is the second one, the Academy Locator. And you can find out where in your states uh, these, these uh, academies exist. I bring this to you today uh, to show you basically that we, we believe that e-learning uh, is the wave of the future. Um, but the, the problem for e-learning is that it requires a lot of bandwidth. Each one of these schools have um, uh, broadband applications. That's part of the uh, that's part of the agreement that the schools make with us when we um, supply them the curriculum. But there's going to be this is one course. We are developing an e-learning institute uh, that will demonstrate how you can teach almost any subject over the internet. Uh, you can teach, and, the, and the course that they're developing actually is, is another very um, interesting one, binary math. Um, and I think that w the point is that we believe that in order to take advantage of these opportunities, we will have to expand um, and increase uh, broadband in our country. And um, uh, to, be, to be able to take advantages of the efficiencies of teaching online. Because teaching online has, uh, there are, it, it will be absolutely the wave of the future. At, at this point, we do have 95% of U.S. schools are connected to the Internet. Um, and many of those schools, 63% uh, of them have, um, have either T1 lines or T3 lines, um, and 23% are using cable modems. But what's happening is that that's just, the, that's just the public school system. That doesn't speak to the secondary school system, or to the post-secondary school system, or to um, uh, parochial schools and other schools. 14% uh, of these schools are still using dial-up. But most of these connections are to the school district. Um, and if we're going to use these courses um, widely in classrooms, we will need more broadband. Um, it will be uh, important for us to uh, have that in order to achieve this. So I just wanted to give that one example, Blair, of okay. how this works. Great. Thank you very much. Um, we're delighted to have Congressman Pence, who just joined us, and I think you had a hearing this morning on, on rural broadband issues. Would you like to come up and say a couple of words, or are you into your lunch? Welcome, uh, Congressman Pence. Thank you so much, and um, I uh, appreciate whoever ordered lunch. That's a really dandy roast beef sandwich. Haven't had that much red meat at one time in quite a while. I, uh, we did just complete actually what was a joint hearing this morning on the House side. Uh, Congressman John uh, Thune uh, chairs the subcommittee on rural enterprise of the Small Business Committee. Uh, while I'm a, a freshman member of Congress from Indiana, my name is Mike Pence. I took over uh, the seat held by Congressman David McIntosh. Um, I serve as the chairman of the Subcommittee on Regulatory Reform and Oversight, and we just completed actually our third uh, consecutive hearing on high-tech challenges uh, uh, in uh, rural America. And I would just echo the, the last speaker's uh, comments about the 
the urgent need of expanding broadband access, particularly given the testimony that we heard um, uh, during uh, this morning and last week's uh, uh, subcommittee uh, joint hearing. So there is just simply an extraordinary need that we move forward uh, in a prudent way. There was a call for additional grant support. There is uh, what is widely described as a capital drought uh, for many of those that are uh, on the frontier of providing broadband access. Uh, not only in rural areas, but in some urban areas that have been the, the object of what can uh, accurately be described as redlining uh, by certain organizations and uh, that being permitted even by a municipal authority. So uh, this is an issue that we're committed uh, to exploring. I know I speak for uh, Chairman Thune uh, when I say that uh, we're just deeply committed as we go forward into a possible a revision of the Telecommunications Act of 1996 or even a new legislation like that introduced by my uh, my friend uh, Phil English from Pennsylvania that that we do so with the ultimate objective that uh, as I said at a press conference this morning uh, that we not be able 20 years from now to be able to tell uh, what part of America has broadband access from another by a satellite photograph taken at night uh, I truly believe that economic development around America is, is uh, going to be reflective of, of how we address this challenge and whether we say that all Americans, uh, whether they live in the heart of major cities or in the heart of the heartland, uh, like I serve, uh, have access to the new economy through broadband, and it is a goal that we'll pursue. I thank you for uh, yielding for just a few moments, and I want to congratulate uh, the Internet Caucus and say that um, uh, we just appreciate uh, your all's willingness to lead and the members of this panel to be a part of, of absolutely one of the most vital uh, debates that we will take on in the days ahead on Capitol Hill. It's an honor to be with you today, and I thank you. Um, <clears throat> our final panelist, uh, which is a signal to you all to start getting your questions in mind, uh, is Paul Schomburg, uh, who is the Manager of Government and Public Affairs for Panasonic. Um, his background includes 13 years with Panasonic, where he has advised various of their business units uh, in technology policy in the areas of telecommunications, digital television, intellectual property, and federal procurement. Paul. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to be here this afternoon, and in the interest of time, I'm also going to press on and just get right into the meat of our presentation here. Uh, what I'd like to talk to you about is digital networking for life from Panasonic's vision for broadband in the home and what it will take for consumers to accept broadband and actually um, adopt it. Uh, the, uh, the current environment for broadband, there's been a tremendous expansion in the internet technology industry, tremendous increase in technological complexity, and that has resulted in some market fragmentation consumer confusion, and it's slowed somewhat the adoption of internet-connected technologies. Um, in Panasonic, we believe that in order for the consumers to adopt broadband technologies, there are certain, there's basically four requirements. Uh, one, it has to add value to their lives. They need technologies which will um, give them more time with their families, give them more uh, access to different services that will improve their life. It has to be simple and easy to use. You can't um, have, you, m most consumers don't want to deal with an alphabet soup of specifications and standards and wires and connectors. Has, uh, service has to be made simple so that if a key component goes down in, in a home network, uh, that could be easily repaired or replaced. And it has to provide access to compelling content and new services. There are a lot of potential, though, to broadband, and some examples of some of these opportunities are that will also be very beneficial to society are telemedicine, which will help lower health care costs and expand service to unreached people, intelligent transportation systems, traffic, you know, improving traffic management, helping energy efficiency, and interactive digital television, which will help um, bridge the digital divide by providing interactive content to people at, uh, at, at relatively low prices. Uh, so let's look at these, these success factors. Uh, consumers want a value-added lifestyle. Um, how do we get there? The, the, the enabling technology for connecting a, a lot of different things to one network is open standards. And when you have open standards that everybody can build to and, and, and is widely supported, then you get a cornucopia of technological innovation that will, that will flourish in the marketplace. Um, 
ease of use requires uh, plug and play technology. Uh, things like uh, Bluetooth and uh, some of the wireless uh, uh, networking technologies that are available where you don't have to use uh, wires or uh, have potentially incompatible standards. Um, this, the service and making service sim simple for consumers, um, really uh, you need to start looking at remote diagnostics because the, the complexity of these um, of the products and how they interact with each other on a network uh, really determine how, how, how well they are, how, how well they, they function. Um, and also then access to compelling content and services. Um, those type of uh, content providers need assurance that their material that they're providing, their high value material, it will be protected um, in, but consumers need the protection to happen in a consumer friendly way so that their expectations for use of the material they receive can still be maintained. Um, and I want to show you some examples of technologies that Matsushita is, uh, uh, Panasonic is looking at that will, will make this happen. First in the area of making sense out of the alphabet soup, uh, Panasonic is a founding member of the Internet Home Alliance which is a nonprofit alliance uh, dedicated to enhancing consumers' understanding, appreciation, and adoption of the Internet lifestyle. And the Internet lifestyle means always on Internet, um, always available to a, a variety of services. And there's a number of other companies, uh, uh, including Cisco and uh, Sears, Motorola, 3Com, Best Buy, uh, the whole list of, of companies which have joined the alliance and are starting to support that education uh, approach. Um, in the home, uh, the, the home gateway uh, market is going to be a, a key technology that will enable a variety of different uh, products to be all connected within the home. Uh, Panasonic is marketing the concourse networking gateway, which allows you to connect a cable modem, a DSL line, satellite, whatever uh, your internet source is. It's, 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 it's uh, last mile agnostic too. Uh, to um, a home network, and then that broadband link can be shared with a multiple multitude of devices in the home. It includes a built-in firewall for protection, and it you can provide that in the home through a wireless link with a uh, PC card. Uh, you can have an Ethernet network or home home PNA, which uses the phone lines in the home, so no new cabling is required. Um, the number of other companies are also marketing similar products. But to make the, uh, the products in the home then work in that area, um, Panasonic recognizes that um, you need to provide them with applications that are going to make that easy to use. And uh, we've established a, a digital concept center in uh, Cupertino, California, which works with some of the small startup companies in the Silicon Valley area. Uh, some of them listed here, and, I'll, and I want to show you a couple examples of things that they have developed that are going to help broadband advance and make consumers more comfortable with uh, broadband technologies. Um, and if you're interested in further information, they're at digitalconceptcenter.com. Um, first, in the area of simplified service. Uh, everyone here probably has had a, a product go bad on them and uh, they're not really sure why. And uh, so the current approach is uh, you call a service center, um, uh, they talk to you over the phone, they try to figure out, you know, they ask you a bunch of technical questions and you get to read some uh, uh, diagnostic stuff. Maybe they send a truck out to, um, to look at the product or you ship the product back to a service center and uh, maybe they have to come back a second time. Uh, in the meantime, you're without service, and this typically might take you know eight to ten days and be fairly expensive for the service provider. The uh, the idea of remote diagnostics is, and the uh, the service that uh, Panasonic is working with a company called Senvid. Um, you call the service center, and then they instruct you to download a small Senvid program, which enables then um, Senvid or the the service provi service center to log in, look at your customer online while you're talking with them at the same time so they can see what you're seeing and they can look at parameters perhaps you're not comfortable with or you don't understand. And then they can diagnose and perhaps even repair that online and that might only take an hour. 
in your background business. Uh, and when, um, when digital networks start becoming vital to life, then uh, this is going to be key. Uh, another, another area that uh, the, the Digital Concept Center is working is, is DVD technology and making DVDs connect um, uh, through the internet uh, seamlessly to enable you to look at content on your DVD and on the internet. And this is kind of a, uh, a way to experiment with what the future of interactive television is going to bring, where television uh, broadcast uh, on a, using a digital television comes into your home at 19.2 megabits per second, giving you an awful lot of uh, room there to include additional programs, uh, interactive content that goes along with the program and uh, provides uh, uh, educational opportunities to get into more details on the History Channel or whatever you're looking at. Um, another way to provide access to uh, content is um, the, uh, the use of storage media which will allow you to take that um, content which you've downloaded and keep it in a secure manner so that it can be time shifted or place shifted so you can use it wherever you want to. Um, the SD memory card uh, is one of Panasonic's uh, uh, partnerships and uh, it recently has been uh, deployed by uh, Palm and their new Palm Pilots. Uh, that will enable you to take your high value content, your either things like audio or even things like uh, medical information or anything you that, that you can think of in a small postage stamp card uh, w which has a potential right now of 64 megabits of storage uh, wherever you go. Um, Another type of content that we're working on is uh, is in the home area of home telemedicine. The Panasonic Vital Signs Box is a uh, uh, a new product we're uh, we're developing that will enable someone in, in a uh, rural area or uh, who can't get to the doctor's office very easily to do some simple um, home measurements uh, on a either daily basis, hourly basis, or on request. And the doctor can then look at that and look at it over time. So that reaches beyond the walls of the hospital and it helps uh, bring medicine to people who are, um, uh, are, are underserved currently. Um, so those are a few of this, the, the ideas and things that Panasonic is working on to make broadband more acceptable to consumers. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, great. Thank you very much and, and thanks to everyone. Uh, now it's time for you all to ask questions. Um, I'm, uh, I'll take any questions, but let me just let me just start by kind of getting a factual question. I think is related to one of the policy debates. But I just mean this in the kind of factual second uh, section. Um, but do you want to tell us what is the status of the multiple ISP trials on uh, on the cable network? Uh, sure. Yeah, that I, I think might be of interest to everybody. The multiple ISP trials, really, you know, the way the the cable modems have been set up originally is that. If you're at home, you have a cable modem, uh, you send a message, it goes to the head end of the cable system, from there it goes to the ISP, and then from there out to the internet and back. In terms of multiple ISP trials, um, what will happen is the user types on his PC with the cable modem, it goes to the head end, and then from there it makes a selection to different ISPs, and then from the different ISPs out to the internet. Um, there are several technical trials underway right now. Time Warner is doing a trial in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, AT&T is doing a trial in Denver. And Comcast and Cox, of course, have announced that they're uh, going to be doing trials in the future as well. The big challenge with multiple ISP, these technical trials, is really making sure the system works together as a whole, that the back office systems, the billing systems, the customer care systems, and the uh, uh, the ability to communicate with, with messages between the uh, cable operator and the ISP that uh, these back office systems work properly. So that's the big challenge with the technical trials. Okay. Uh, questions from the audience? Um, what, uh, yeah, go ahead. Become the pain at times, having to always be the one to show them how to get online, or just you know, just seeing how reluctant they are to, uh, 
With respect to broadband specifically, it's a little early to tell because broadband really is a fairly new market. There's only about uh, 7.5, 8 million homes that actually have broadband connections today. But in terms of Internet uh, uptake, the uh, older population, about 55, is actually one of the fastest growing markets today. It's primarily because of email. And I have my mother-in-law is 88. She lives with me. And I, she's, she asked, I couldn't believe it, but I brought my computer home for my daughter from college and she wanted to use it. So they're getting to the point now because they're, you know, grandkids are online that they're beginning to use it, but primarily for email, not for entertainment and those kinds of things. Anybody else want to? Yeah, I think uh, this is why this underscores the importance of simplicity and uh, uh, ease of service, that uh, you don't want to make the technology too complex. Um, one of the things that Panasonic has been working on in that area is uh, making our products more accessible to people with disabilities. And uh, because the elderly population in Japan is very much a larger proportion as even compared to the United States and much growing, growing much quicker. Uh, we see that as a key component to making our products easier to use and when you make them more accessible, they're more easy to use as well. Okay. Hey, Eric. I'd like to follow up on your question with uh, Mr. Check over there. When you're talking for a minute about multiple ISP trials, um, earlier Mr. Story from Enron was talking that he wants to offer a broadband video on demand entertainment service. Would he be considered an ISP for this kind of trial, or is it, is it a separate kind of thing if you just want to have with a, um, um, one, not a distributed thing, not an internet thing? Uh, I'm not uh, familiar with their specific architecture, but to make some, some educated guesses here, I would think that in, in terms of a video on demand system, and correct me if I'm, I'm wrong here, but your system would, would have components that would sit perhaps at the cable head end that would, use, that would operate over the cable system and not necessarily over the internet, which is where the, the multiple ISP effort is focused. That one point on that I'd like to make, it's not a policy point, it's just a reality that in Verizon's uh, DSL, we have about 720,000 customers, but only half of those are our customers and our ISP sells a service. The other half are actually other ISPs that are wholesaling our service. So our network is actually used by both competitive uh, exchange companies who are you know, essentially telephone companies that are selling broadband service and ISPs, and about half of our services today are actually offered by somebody else, not by Verizon. Marilyn? I have a question um, for all of you, really. Um, and that is, uh, in my view, the killer application for the narrowband internet for all of us probably came onto the internet in the past few years. Um, and then became familiar with the World Wide Web when it was invented. Email probably still <coughs> remains the killer application to us, particularly the enhancements <coughs> that are being added to email. You know, it eases our business life, it eases our daily life, can't do anything with our friends and with people that we need. I can't imagine handing out a business card today in this country or any other country that doesn't have my email address on it. And I tell people two ways to get me on my cell phone or use my email, right? So when you think about the translation, if, if you agree with that, that email and its enhancements have been kind of a killer application for pull to today's uses of the internet, if you agree with that, how do you see the role that email and enhancements will play in the blocking? <clears throat> this is an important question uh, because I do think that enhancements to email, and I mean by that something like instant messaging, really change your PC into a communications device. The, and this is one of the points about broadband people don't think about. It. It's actually a technology that allows you to keep your PC on all the time. And most people do when they have a DSL connection. I have DSL and that's what I do is leave it up all the time. Instant messaging then becomes a viable communications technology because then people ping you and you answer them. I have instant messaging in my office too and my daughter in West Virginia never calls me anymore. She sends me instant messages. So it really is make sure PC more of a communications device. The data shows so far, and actually some of it came from AT&T Media One, some good research on when people have broadband for more than a year, what do they do? And do they change the usage patterns? Two things happen. One is they use their PC twice as long on, on online than a regular online uh, dial-up person. About 20.7 hours versus 10 or 11 hours for the average dial-up customer per week. And the second thing is they often do begin to make their P move their PC into the TV room because this becomes a family device. It's, everybody goes to it and looks up things. It's not just a PC. You, know, you, you wouldn't boot up your PC in many cases, unfortunately, to look up a movie. But if it's already, already on, you do. So it really has a major value. Any, anyone else on the panel want to talk about um, that? Let me ask a question um, 
Uh, starting with Bob, uh, the capital markets were funding huge numbers of broadband networks uh, over the last couple of years, but obviously there's been a, a very large retreat, and particularly given the fixed wireless area where two of the great stars of a couple of years ago in fixed wireless, Windstar Intelligent, have now gone under. What does that tell us about the future of fixed wireless, but also of, of broadband? Well, I think what it, what it tells us, with all due respect to Windstar Intelligent, is that um, they had a flawed business model um, for a, for a number of for a number of reasons. Well, that's stating the obvious now. But first of all, they were they were operating in a very different um, area of spectrum than we operate in. They were operating at 24 gigahertz and above, and the significant difference there is that the signal at those high frequencies only carries two to three miles. And so in order to serve a metropolitan area, you have to put in many, many, many cell sites. And it's very, very expensive to do that. And because of the expense in doing that in part, and because of the business model in part, Windstar Intelligent targeted large business customers. Unfortunately, wireline carriers the incumbent local exchange carriers and the competitive local exchange carriers with their own fiber facilities were targeting the same customers with fiber. And so Windstar Intelligent were in a very difficult space. Um, and, and it didn't work. Um, but a lot of that was driven by the frequencies that they were operating in. The frequencies that MMDS operates in carry 20 to 35 miles. You can cover an entire metropolitan area with one cell site. And also, the, and because of that, because the incremental cost and the, the initial capital cost of putting in a system the, to serve an entire metropolitan area, not a big city, but a smaller city, the central tower in associated electronics costs about a million dollars, which is very, very little. And in addition, so because it's so little, we can, we can target residential and small and medium businesses who don't have alternative broadband providers. So I think that they're very different. Um, Windstar Intelligent face very different problems than, than the, the problems or the market that we face. Um, yes? How does fixed broadband deal with um, hilly rural areas? Good question. Well, I mean, hilly, hilly any areas. Um, fixed, fixed wireless right now is, is a line of sight technology. Um, it works really well in cities like Phoenix, where you can mount your antenna on a big mountain and you have an incredibly flat city with almost no trees. In hillier areas, it's more difficult. Um, we are working with Cisco to develop next generation technology which will alleviate the line of sight <coughs> restriction so that you won't require perfect line of sight. Um, if there's trees in your way or buildings, you'll still be able to get your signal. And the other way to do it is to put in um, translators, repeaters, or cell sites, additional cell sites to cover areas that are masked by topography, by hills or dense foliage. How are you going to go through buildings? Are you looking at a different spectrum? Or? No, you go around buildings. And I, I, I'm not sure I can explain how the black box works, but what it does is instead of the uh, right now, if you hit a building, you get multipath interference. You're, you're interfering with your own signal. Um, the OFDM, orthogonal frequency division multiplexing technology, uses that multipathing to its advantage to enhance the signal um, by reading what the bits are and then putting them back in the, in the appropriate order. The interesting thing about Phoenix, too, by the way, showing the economics here that's interesting about these deployments is that in Phoenix, you've got incredible amounts of competition from almost every one of the technology we talked about. It's flat, and a lot of the deployment there is fairly new because you've got a lot of new development, a lot of growth. So even DSL is, in many cases, the loops are short enough, they're doing video over DSL. So you've got video, you've got cable, and you've got fixed wireless. I mean, it's a very competitive market for video. Phoenix is the place to live if you want broadband. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have time for another question, Rick. Uh, we were talking about the continental U.S. and the, the, the sort of footprint, I guess, of the, the satellite. I just wanted to better understand, were you saying that uh, with the service that Texas is offering today, that virtually anywhere in rural America, someone would pay for Yes, service? yes. So what do they need to do if they just 
fall off and get a dish and bounce it? That's correct. That's correct. Just a dish. So, so there's nothing else, though, on the ground in the sense that, like for the fixed wireless guys, you know, they've got a cell tower. No. It's a dish and a box in your home that, you know, hooks it up to your PC. Um, the service in, is comparable to cable, and it depends on whether you also package that with um, video. Uh, but it's around uh, sixty bucks. And how many people could be served? Uh, multiple. In, in some cases, um, and th there is no limit like there was with DBS on on the PCs with the two-way broadband. Right. I guess I'm thinking just, I mean, you know, if people are like small businesses. Well, no, we're not talking policy today, but I mean, if people are concerned about rural America sounds like, you know, you're the answer. Um, I would say that that's correct. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I'm here. <laughs> the, the other thing that, you know, um, our friends with the wireline industry sort of are um, one slide alluded to is what I lovingly call our cow picture. And for the last half mile with our wireline friends, whether it's from the cable plant um, or head end or the, ca the telephone plant, the last half mile for them on average is between 10 and 15,000. For the satellite footprint, because it is ubiquitous and from a full cone slot, you see the whole continent of the United States, on an average it's 600 bucks for the same last half mile. Can you self-install Pegasus? Can we self-install? You as a customer self-install it? Um, no. I didn't think so. No. What, I'm not saying that this is not, it's not available everywhere. I'm just saying is when you've got capacity limitations, they include things like installation. So you can't get it everywhere unless somebody can install it for you, correct? And you haven't got enough people to do it everywhere. Um, I wouldn't agree with that. We have people installing it all over the country. Well, okay. <laughs> so. Okay. We have distributors all over the country, but you can check our website and uh, give us a call. <laughs> okay. Um, we want to wrap up around 1.30. It's about that time. Let me, uh, go, would everyone please give a round of applause to the panelists. Thank you very much for uh, providing it. Let me remind everyone that the policy-oriented uh, discussion of broadbands. We're going to have two of those, June 7th and July 12th. Will they be here in the same room? Does anyone know? Okay. All right. Again, thank you very much. Good to see you. Okay. Thanks. Nice to meet you, Nat. Send your email. Thanks. Thank you. You know. Thank you. They keep giving you the. Enjoy. 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 Enj